cry. Felt like my my face was just going to explode. Could it be a suicide attempt or a bizarre plot to fake his own death? The man who fell to earth was a man of God gunned down. Mary Winkler premeditatedly and intentionally killed Matthew Winkler. His wife on trial. And the question on everyone's mind. But we need to know why. Watch this man. Shocking secrets. Matthew, you want me to wear it? To dress up? Dress up for what purpose, man? Sex. Faith betrayed. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. No one really knows what their breaking point is until they're tested. In this hour, you'll meet two people who felt like their lives had become impossible. Did they crack under pressure or did they make a conscious decision to solve their problems with a shocking act? First, the story of Marcus Schrenker. He felt his life was crashing down around him, so he came up with a plan. He got into his plane, and then he jumped out of it. In 2010, Deborah Roberts interviewed him. What was his motive? Did he really try to commit suicide? Well, that's what you'll have to decide. Once I got near that back door, it was just instant out it went. It was like a 2,000-pound gorilla it just yanked me out. It was a harrowing experience, says pilot Marcus Schrenker. Over the night skies of Alabama, sucked out of his five-passenger single-engine turboprop, the parachute, he says, snags on the tail of the airplane. He took my parachute and just ripped it. He just tore it. And then he got very quiet. And I looked up, and the parachute was all tangled. I knew it was just a little piece of it was open and I was probably going 40 50 miles an hour dropping dropping and as I saw the ground coming up I said father forgive me I knew it'd be over a man in free fall the bizarre and mysterious plunge of 38 year old Marcus Schrenker mirrored an even more dramatic descent in his personal life before it all unraveled, Shrinker appeared to be a family man who couldn't ask for anything more. A lot of people, I'm sure you've heard, have said that you seem to have it all. Beautiful wife, high living life. What was life like for you at that point? It was wonderful. We had a um, fantastic marriage, three beautiful children. Um, life was all that we ever thought it would be and all we ever dreamed it would be. A financial advisor, Shrinker owned an investment firm called Icon Group. His family was the picture of wealth. He even did an ad for the local Lexus dealer. No airport security lines or carry-on restrictions for the Shrinkers. They vacationed with the company's $2 million private airplane, piloted by a man who loved the thrill of being up in the air. What was it about flying that you liked so much? Um, there's a saying back in college that flying is the most fun you can have with your clothes on. Ah! Uh, flying to me was a lifelong dream. But it wasn't all clear skies for Marcus Schranker. On the ground, there were bumps on the road, lots of them. Did you see yourself as someone who could turn, who had a Jekyll and Hyde personality, as they said? I did, and it was starting to scare me. I didn't understand why this was happening. You would go from very calm to not so calm and very combative. And as I aged, it got worse and worse. His diagnosis was bipolar disorder, and he began treatment, but often didn't take his meds. And the storybook marriage with Michelle was straining at the seams. She really put up with a lot of you know, me, that I think was, was stressful on her. What was she putting up with from you? The mood swings. One minute I would be very calm, and the next minute I would be very angry and out of control, and not even make, be making sense with what I was saying. That's not all she was putting up with. Her husband had a secret life with another woman, Kelly Baker. She worked at a local airport, and pretty soon they were flying around on his private plane. Schrenker even set her up in a condo. 
Michelle told NBC it came as a shock. He never really told me. I, uh, I saw him and her moving into the condo together. When I was uh, at the condo with this other woman, Michelle came there and she was very upset. She confronted you? Absolutely. What did she say? Uh, I don't remember exactly everything she, she said. I can assure you she was very hurt. She was crying. She His marriage was on the brink of destruction. Shrinker continued seeing Baker, the other woman, and his behavior became more volatile. His therapist told 2020 that Shrinker's bipolar disorder would swing him through manic highs and deep depressions with talk of suicide. On December 30th, 2008, Michelle filed for divorce. At the same time, what Shrinker didn't know was that his investment firm was under investigation by the state of Indiana for allegations of fraud and bilking clients. On December 31st, the day after Michelle filed for divorce, authorities raided their mansion. Shrinker in Florida with his girlfriend got a panic call from his wife. She said, there are people here looking through our house. What are you talking about? She said, there are investigators here looking through our house, looking through the office. And I was just completely blindsided by it. I couldn't even understand what was happening. I didn't, it was tough to tell what was real and what was not at that point. By January 2009, Shrinker's once perfect life was disintegrating. His assets frozen, his business closed pending a criminal investigation, his family in tatters. It just felt like I was coming unraveled and um, almost like my brain was popping. And I just snapped. I drove home to our house in Indianapolis. And I came inside and um, there was four plates on the kitchen table. And that was always, the fifth plate was always me. And she, um, she stood up and said, you know, welcome here. So he fled. On the evening of January 11, 2009, with the world closing in on him, Marcus Schrenker drove to the airport where he kept his Piper airplane. He revved up the single engine turboprop, filed a flight plan for Destin, Florida, and began a trip that was about to make national headlines. A day later, neighbor Tom Britt gets a call from a reporter saying that Marcus Schrenker's plane crashed and he's dead. Britt's gut reaction was that it must be some kind of trick. I said, if there's somebody in that plane, it's not Marcus Schrenker. I said, whoever told you that he's in that plane, you need to call them back and get a confirmation on that body because I guarantee you he did not crash in that plane. When we come back, what happened on that final flight? I didn't call the tower, I didn't call the ground. I blew the cockpit door at 24,000 feet. I knew it was at the end. There's no turning back. Stay with us. Marcus Schrenker, a once wealthy husband, father, financial advisor, and stunt pilot, his life spinning out of control, files a flight plan from Indiana to Florida and boards his single-engine corporate plane. I didn't call the tower. I didn't call the ground. I didn't have the runway plowed. I just took off. He climbs into the sky, knowing that his affair and volatile behavior have led his wife to file for divorce. The state of Indiana investigating him for fraud has frozen his assets and shut down his investment business. And he says he popped 10 OxyContin painkillers. Was this the beginning of a desperate suicide run? 90 minutes into the flight, somewhere over Alabama, Shrinker radios air traffic control, reporting turbulence. I did what I said you like, I was No answer from Shrinker. Then... Hey, Dallas Charlie Gaston Airport, it's uh, 
10 o'clock and 15 miles. Birmingham Airport's at 1 o'clock and about 30 miles, sir. Still no reply from Marcus Schrenker. Finally, this. I bleed profusely. God damn, he's going to cry. The Coast Guard's alerted, and two F-15 fighters are scrambled out of New Orleans. They fly alongside Schrenker's plane and see the windshield is not cracked. But they can't make out a pilot inside. They fear that he's on the floor of the plane dead. But Marcus Schrenker is alive. I blew the cockpit door at 24,000 feet. It was like someone had popped my lungs. And it felt like my... My face was just going to explode. My ears, everything. And I knew it was it. It was the end. There's no turning back. He says his idea was simple. Commit suicide, make it look like an accident, and have his wife Michelle collect the insurance. To ensure that he would die, he says he disabled the parachute. I wire tied it shut. The D-ring wire tied it shut. So once I started the process, I couldn't stop it. If he really disabled his parachute, as he says, his death would be certain. Yet the accounts of the next few minutes are murky and bizarre. He claims he swiped the tail of the plane during his plunge, hitting his head and partially releasing the tied shut parachute. Doug Carmody, who runs executive flight training, instructs pilots on the same aircraft that Marcus Schrenker flew on that day. He dissected the accident for us. If he jumped out of the airplane and hit his head, the tail would be moving 170 to 190 miles an hour. It would do some damage. So I don't think he jumped out and hit his head. But jump, he did. So do you remember hitting the ground? I never hit the ground. Um, Was it a swamp? I remember hearing this explosion of wood and feeling this yank up on my harnesses. I had fished a tree perfectly coming through it and it had grabbed the stringers and slowed me down and then somehow I splashed into the river. It was the Coosa River in rural Childersburg, Alabama near Birmingham. The parachute he claims he disabled works perfectly and the parachute was on top of me. And um, I remember I had to try to ball the parachute up because it was dragging me in the current. Did you want to be rescued at this point? I don't know if I did or not. I, uh, I, I was so stunned that I had lived. I had prepared myself for death. Now in the woods, cold and drenched, his airplane flying south toward the Gulf of Mexico, Schrenker says he's delirious, but makes it into town where he crosses paths with a Childersburg police officer. 45 minutes later, his plane crashes in Milton, Florida, just a few miles short of the Gulf. He lies to the police, saying he was in a canoeing accident, and the officer drops him off at this motel. Yet look at this security camera footage of Shrinker that night, appearing completely unharmed. And here is where the story of Marcus Shrinker's journey takes an incredible turn. He walks from the motel to this nearby storage facility, where he finds a red Yamaha motorcycle. His red Yamaha motorcycle. He starts it up and speeds off. Pretty convenient that your motorcycle was parked there. Yes. Some people would say that's more than coincidence, that right. maybe you planned this this way. Yeah, I, I can see how they propound that theory. Did you plan it? No. No, not like that. When we come back, the police find Marcus Schrenker's plane, and the questions begin. The pilot was not in this location. No blood. Windshields were intact. It was clear to us that we were dealing with something a lot more than just a plane that had crashed. Stay with us. An airplane flying on autopilot headed toward the Gulf of Mexico. The cockpit empty. The pilot on the ground thousands of feet below. The plane crashes just short of the Gulf. The plane actually rolled and landed on its roof and was upside down with the propeller up against that 
small oak tree. Sergeant Scott Haynes of the Santa Rosa, Florida Sheriff's Office discovers there's no pilot on board. It was clear to us that the pilot was not in this location. Uh, no blood, windshields were intact. When we started piecing things like that together, it started unraveling very quickly that we were dealing with something a lot more than just a plane that had crashed. Back in Alabama, the pilot, Marcus Schrenker, lands in his parachute and is on the move. He had told air traffic control he was bleeding, but it was a lie. With barely a scratch on him, he's able to make it to this storage garage where a red motorcycle, his motorcycle, is waiting for him, 500 miles from home. But how did it get there? He said he had broken down, and someone down the road directed him our way, and he wanted to rent one of our garages. It would be another lie. This one told to Lova Wood, the storage facility owner, the day before Schrenker's bizarre flight. Calm and friendly, he gives her a phony name, saying he needs to store his broken motorcycle for a couple of days. Just extremely charming, personable, really talkative. Um, said he was headed to Florida. It would be the centerpiece of his diabolical deception. Remember, Schrenker stashed his motorcycle in nearly the exact place where he'd fall from the sky the next day. On January 10th, you drove a trailer with a motorcycle to Alabama. What was your plan? What were you doing? I didn't have a plan. I was so mentally devastated at that point. It was really the divorce that had hit me very hard. I just snapped and I started driving. But U.S. Marshal Frank Shimento says Shrinker indeed had a plan that was detailed and deliberate. It was obvious in gathering all the intelligence and all the information about this flight from Indiana to Florida that he devised an escape plan to fake his own death. There was a lot of planning that went into this. Yet Shrinker still denies that he was planning to vanish. Do you really expect people to believe that you just happened to find your motorcycles there? I mean, that, that just doesn't add up to a lot of people. If I was trying to fake my death, I would have left my IDs and everything in the airplane. I would have filled up the airplane full of fuel and let it go out over the Gulf or wherever it was trying to go. You would make, make sure that the airplane couldn't be found. Another bold lie. In fact, Shrinker had topped off his fuel tank in what appeared to be the perfect disappearance scheme. Jump out of the plane and let it keep flying into the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico. He would be presumed dead and no one would find his body. Instead, the plane crashed just a few miles short of the Gulf and Shrinker's perfect crime disintegrated. Once we went through the airplane and inspected things that were present at the crash site, we found a lot more valuable evidence the wreckage with no pilot sparked a multi-state dragnet. The most critical piece of evidence that we received was the fact that a, a U.S. campground directory was located in the wreckage with the Florida state campground uh, sites ripped out of it. And in fact, Marcus Schrenker was on the run to a campground in Chattahoochee, Florida, nearly 24 hours after plunging from his plane. Mr. Shrinker pulled up on a motorcycle. It was quite early evening, and it was cold, really cold. Caroline Hastings and her husband checked him into a campsite. When Shrinker didn't come out for breakfast the next morning, they became suspicious. We both just had an uneasy, just an, it was just odd. We just had an odd feeling. Inside his tent, Shrinker's lies were about to catch up to him. On the laptop he'd stored with his motorcycle, he was able to go online where he got a big surprise. He learned that his plane had not disappeared in the Gulf as he planned, and he was now a wanted man. When I saw myself on, you know, ABC on your on the website, it was like the it was over. You know, it was, I had no desire to live at that point because um, I just I embarrassed my family so much. He probably thought he had a very ingenious escape plan initially and it, it unraveled very quickly and uh, he may have had an alternate plan that if it didn't work out he was going to commit suicide. 
And this time he really was intending to end his life. He slashed his wrist and was close to death. But by now, authorities who knew of the plot were closing in. My husband answered the phone and just asked my husband, you know, do you guys have anything odd going on? And my husband had told him the whole story. Do you remember being discovered at the campsite? No. You had lost quite a bit of blood. Yeah, they said I was as white as a sheet and I wasn't breathing when they got to me. He was rushed by helicopter to a local hospital. At the campground, marshals gathered more evidence that Marcus Schrenker was outfitting himself for escape and survival. In the saddlebags on his motorcycle, he had a lot of MREs, meals ready to eat, uh, military type food. He had extra clothing, a quantity of cash, close to $3,000. He had a GPS unit. The bizarre journey of Marcus Schrenker was over. His next stop, a jail cell. He pled guilty to two federal charges, filing a false distress call and intentionally destroying an airplane. He's serving 50 months in prison. While he admitted in court documents that he deliberately tried to crash the plane in the Gulf, he told 2020 different versions of the story, saying his bipolar disorder and painkillers left him in a confused fog. The closest he came to admitting the truth was this. It absolutely points to a premeditated desire to run, take the death, crash the airplane because of the motorcycle, because of the forward planning. It's hard for me to grasp that I would do that. What would make a man want to vanish from the earth? Maybe Shrinker felt he had nothing to lose. Aside from the disaster in his personal life, his business dealings were about to land him in hot water. The state of Indiana was close to charging him with fraud. On this matter, Shrinker's uncharacteristically mute. Had you run your companies above board, or had there been anything that could be perceived as fraudulent? Sir, I can't answer that. Are you guilty? No. So these charges that you're facing now in Indiana, you're saying you're completely innocent of those? Yes. As he sits in jail, his wife, Michelle, the divorce isn't final, and their three children have moved out of the family's mansion and are struggling to get by. Michelle told NBC, I'm left holding the bag with everything. It's a turnabout that seems to stir the only genuine reaction in Marcus Schrenker. My oldest son, Tyler has been put through hell because of what I did. My daughter, Alyssa, and my younger son, Jaden. I love all of them so much. I am so sorry for the pain I caused them. Marcus Schrenker later pled guilty to state charges of security fraud and working as an investment banker without a valid license. He's due to be released from prison in 2015. When we come back, a preacher's wife with a dark secret. Mary Winkler premeditatedly, unlawfully, and intentionally killed Matthew Winkler. And the question on everyone's mind. But we need to know why Mary watches you. Stay with us. The people who knew Mary Winkler could hardly believe she had killed her husband. He was a popular minister, and Mary was the preacher's wife. What had happened behind the closed doors of their home? What secrets drove Mary to shoot her husband in the back? She said his last dying word was, why? And that's the question Mary Fulgeniti set out to answer in 2007. Selmer, Tennessee is a picturesque rural town, proud of its southern roots. It sits right in the thick of the country's Bible Belt, where every block there's another church, or even two. At the Church of Christ, Matthew Winkler, a fifth-generation minister, preached from the pulpit with a voice full of passion and love for the Lord. 
Can you imagine all of us standing around with all the other saints? Heaven, according to Matthew, was reserved only for the righteous. The sound of talking, the sound of laughter, the sound of singing, the sound of praise, and how great a roar that will be. Kevin Redman, a deacon at the church, was a close friend. How would you describe Matthew as a preacher? He was a minister that might step on your toes, but that was his job. Matthew Winkler had what appeared to be the ideal family. Three lovely daughters and a beautiful wife, Mary, who he met at Bible college. Mary's sisters welcomed Matthew into their family. She was really happy. They fit so well together. He fit into our family. We we're a very loud, outgoing, everyone laughs and talks at the same time, and he seemed to fit right in with that. Did he appear loving and caring? Yeah. Yes. He was Mary's equal in being an, an open, warm-hearted person. Mary came from a devout Church of Christ family where the husband is the undisputed head of the household and divorce is frowned upon. Both Mary and Matthew abided by the conservative teachings of the church. In Matthew's words, it is a church where sinners are warned they will pay. God has made it clear. The soul who sins shall die. How did the congregation react to him? Lovingly. He always had a smile uh, and brought a smile out of everyone else. How did the congregation feel about Mary? We loved her as well. It was a total package. Him and her was a total package. But Matthew Winkler had made a very different impression on some of his neighbors in this pious rural town. Uh, preachers are supposed to be nice, soft, gentle. He had a temper on him. I've never met a preacher like him. Over time, Mary's sister saw glimpses of another side to Matthew. Anything could make him mad. You wouldn't know what it was, and you couldn't tell because it was always like, Mary, go to the other room. In the middle of her being with all of you? Yes. Yeah, it was the way you would think that a father, a very stern father, would talk to his child. And it that that disturbs me because I don't see that being a happy marriage. No one foresaw the tragedy that would unfold. It all began one spring evening. When the preacher did not show for the weekly Wednesday night service, Deacon Redmond and the church elders went to his house. Inside the master bedroom, they found what they never could have imagined. So Matthew laying there on his back. The covers of the bed were all under him. He was in his bed clothes. That foam was uh, protruding from his mouth and nose. And uh, we knew pretty obviously that he had he was dead at that time. The sight was gruesome. A shotgun blast had cut through the 31-year-old preacher's back. He had been left on the floor to die, choking on his own blood. Inside the house, they find no trace of his wife or his three young girls. We assumed that they had been abducted because we found him dead on the floor. And you can only think of bad things at that point. Because this sort of thing just doesn't happen oh, in summer. No, no, it's a small town. It's a sleepy little town. And I mean, this is unbelievable for everyone. Selmer police put out a nationwide Amber Alert. Everyone in town held their breath, hoping that Mary and her daughters, eight-year-old Patricia, six-year-old Alice, and one-year-old Brianna, would be found unharmed. The next evening, Hundreds of miles away in Orange Beach, Alabama, Officer Jason Whitlock identifies the family's missing minivan and approaches with his gun drawn. Many scenarios race through his mind. Was she murdered? Were the kids murdered? Did somebody steal the van? Uh, did somebody kidnap them? To his surprise, Whitlock discovers Mary Winkler and her three children unharmed in the back seat. Strangely, the police describe her as stoic. There's four police cars surround you. They've got a gun pulled on you, telling you to get out of the car. You would be scared, most likely, and you would probably want to know, hey, what's going on? She never asked one question. She never looked scared to me. It was almost like she was expecting it to happen any time. The public perception of Mary Winkler was about to change. Inside the minivan, police discover the shotgun that killed Matthew Winkler. In a matter of seconds, she went from a crime victim to a murder suspect. Detective Stan Stabler interrogated Mary in this very room, recording what he calls the confession. I've obviously done something very bad, so let me just, you know, be the, get the bad. 
you would be my request. Why did this attractive, God-fearing mother of three shoot her husband in the back as he slept in their bed? Well, we need to know why. Man, you know, why'd you shoot him? That was a question she never really answered. I love you dearly. But gosh, he could just nail me in the ground. Just took it like a mouse. He would knock your self-esteem down? Uh -huh. No. No, um, just chewing whatever and that's the problem i have nerve now and i have self-esteem and so my ugly came out a phrase authorities would seize upon my ugly came out i made the choice to do something that was evil and was wrong and illegal strangely during the interrogation mary kept expressing her love for matthew and concern about his reputation no matter what in the end I don't want him smeared. Breaking news. Mary Winkler is the preacher's wife. Back home in sleepy Selmer, the news that the preacher's wife would stand trial for murder. How's Mary feeling? Became a media sensation. Mary, how you feeling? And the question of the day remained the same as the trial began. Why? That was the last word spoken on this earth by Matthew Winkler. And his last word was addressed to the person he thought he could trust, his wife, the defendant, Mary Winkler. When we return in court, the prosecution and the defense face off, and secrets are revealed that no one in this conservative community could have anticipated. Beth, you want me to wear it? To dress up. Dress up for what purpose, Mary? Sex. Stay with us. The religious town of Selmer was rattled by the death of their charismatic young preacher and the murder trial of his sweet, unassuming wife. But this conservative Christian town could hardly have been prepared for the sordid secrets she would reveal about their home life. He threatened me with the shotgun many times. Did he ever ask you to engage in any type of sex that you felt was unnatural? Yes, sir. The couple's troubled private life was in sharp contrast to the ideal public image they portrayed at church. All of us know this did not happen over a bad batch of uh, chocolate chip cookies. It's something extremely bad, extremely evil, for an extremely long time went on um, without so many of us recognizing Mary's father, Clark Freeman, knew something was terribly wrong. Did you try to talk to Mary about your concerns? I tried to persuade her to leave him, and uh, she just did not want to. And she would hang her head and shake it. No, Dad, no, Dad, just shake it so hard, I'm going to work it out. Instead of working it out, Mary was now facing life in prison, and Matthew was dead. Prosecutor Walt Friedland tried to convince the jury it was an open and shut case. Mary Winkler premeditatedly, unlawfully, and intentionally killed Matthew Winkler, a man that did not deserve to die. The prosecutor told the jury that Mary killed her husband to hide the fact that she had gotten involved in get-rich-quick scams and banking schemes that drained the family finances. I told her that if we didn't get it straightened out, there could be criminal charges for doing things like that. And he played that tape recording of Mary's interrogation. And that's the problem. I have nerve now, and I have self-esteem, so my ugly came out. When we spoke to the jurors afterward, it was clear that at this point in the trial, they had no doubt what Mary meant when she said, my ugly came out. She's saying, you know, she did it. She did it on purpose. I thought she was trying to admit to what she did. Even though the case seemed so straightforward, Mary's big city attorneys, Leslie Ballin and Steve Ferris, were about to turn everything around by putting the preacher on trial. Mary Winkler had what appeared to everyone a marriage made in heaven. But behind closed doors, it was a living hell. This was not a premeditated 
killing done with cool purpose. Her attorneys had a surprising game plan. Subscribing to the old adage, the best defense is a good offense, they were going to try and convince the jury that Mary was the real victim, not the preacher husband she shot to death. Mary was his whipping boy. He didn't like the way she talked. He didn't like the way she walked. He didn't like it because she was too fat. One of Matthew's former neighbors, a police officer, testified that Matthew's erratic behavior and explosive temper had earned him a reputation on their street. And what was that reputation as? A bully. I nicknamed him as Tasmanian Devil. The preacher's wife knew all about Matthew Winkler, the bully. On the stand, she revealed a litany of abuses. He told me one time that he was going to cut the brake lines out of the van. He knocked something over, and I bent down to pick it up, and he kicked me. He told me if I ever talked back to him, that he would cut me into a million pieces. In order to try and justify Mary's actions, her attorneys were going to have to assert a battered wife defense. Is that the kind of shoe that you would wear to church? No, sir. Where'd you get that wig, Mary? From Matthew. Why was that shoe bought, Mary? Matthew wanted me to wear it. To dress up. Dress up for what purpose? Sex. The defense showed hundreds of pornographic pictures they found on the Winkler's computer. Mary said Matthew would make her role play many of the sexual acts depicted in the pictures. Expressionless during most of the trial, Mary broke down when she spoke about the degrading acts her husband would make her act out. She reluctantly told the jury what Matthew forced her to do against her will. He just wanted to have sex with my bottom. Did it hurt you? Yes, sir. What were you told when you expressed your concern? He said, okay. But then he would do it again. What was his answer for if it did hurt you? They have surgery and they can fix it. It's just so bad and I just wanted out. She explained that there was no way out of being married to a preacher in the Church of Christ. I had asked Matthew to have a divorce, and he absolutely denied it. That would not be allowed. Deacon Kevin Redmond told us that church doctrine does not allow for divorced preachers. So divorce wasn't really an option then, a real option for Matthew and Mary Winkler, was it? Well, it wasn't if he wanted to keep his position but it's a better option than death. Mary's depiction of Matthew as an abusive husband did not sit well with his friends at the church. Well, all those allegations come from her. Um, he was not here to defend himself. So what do you accept as fact? That was the question facing the jurors. There were no police reports or other documentation of her being battered or abused. She never confided in friends or even her family. So the jury would have to rely on Mary's words alone. Nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors. Did you buy into the defense's explanation um, that it looked like it was the perfect marriage on the outside, but it was the living hell inside? You see that all the time. You see people out and they're just as happy and, and loving and then go home and everything's different. Mother but what the jurors did accept as fact was the defense's depiction of Matthew Winkler. We hold ministers to a higher standard. We, we don't expect them to be bullies. How did that impact your thinking in this case? That led me to believe that Mary was abused. Emotionally, mentally, yes, I believe she was. I believed what she said. Convincing the jury of Matthew's abusive behavior was one thing but persuading them that this behavior justified killing him was another. I think he was probably a jerk, but he didn't deserve what happened to him. There was one final secret left for Mary Winkler to reveal to the jury. Behavior so despicable, it was the last straw for the preacher's wife. Her story began early one morning while she and Matthew were asleep in the bedroom they were awakened by the cries of their one-year-old daughter, Brianna. Matthew kicked me out of the bed. What do you mean, kicked you out of the bed? He just caught me somewhere in the low of my back, and I was on the floor. What happened next? He walked out of the room, 
And then I got it and went after him. Mary followed him to her daughter's room. She said she was fearful because Matthew had a cruel way of silencing their children when they cried. What was he doing? Suffocating her. Mary explained how Matthew would cover the baby's mouth and nose, momentarily suffocating her to get her to stop crying. What did you do? I said, could I please have her? Did you get her? Yeah, he just threw his arms up and walked out and walked away from the crib. Mary comforted her baby until she fell asleep. Distraught and disturbed, she paced back and forth. I was going to go make coffee, but I just wanted to talk to Matthew. What did you want to talk to him about? I just wanted to stop being so mean. Mary, intent on getting Matthew to listen to her, went to the closet and grabbed his shotgun. The next thing she remembers is hearing the gun go boom and seeing him lying on the floor bleeding. How did he look? He went dead. <laughs> did you see any blood or anything? On his nose and his mouth and his ears. I loved his mouth. And it just kept coming. What were you thinking then, Mary? I just thought something terrible had happened. And nobody would ever believe that was an accident. And I'd just lose the girls. Mary's story was that the gun went off by accident. She did not try to help her husband or call 911. Instead, she got her daughters, put them in the minivan, and fled to Alabama. She spent the next day on the beach with the girls. Later that evening, she was arrested. Did you intentionally, purposefully, kill your husband? No, sir. <clears throat> Did you love your husband? Yes, sir. You still love him? Yes, sir. The preacher's wife was not finished explaining herself. The prosecutor was not going to let Mary Winkler's version stand without a fight. What did Matthew Winkler do to deserve to die? Nothing. Nobody made that decision. Matthew Winkler, in fact, did not deserve to die, did he? No. So what was it that led you into the position of accidentally shooting Matthew Winkler? I just wanted to talk to him. It wasn't an accident, was it? Yes, sir. You just wanted to talk to him and he wouldn't listen. So you shot him in the middle of the back while he was asleep. Now, has that memory come back to you, Ms. Winkler? No, sir. Mary stuck to her story and now her fate was in the hands of the jury. Ten women and two men. Ms. Winkler, if you could please stay in, ma'am. Mary could be convicted of first degree murder, second degree, manslaughter, or even a lesser charge. We, the jury, find the defendant, Mary C. Winkler, guilty of voluntary manslaughter. The voluntary manslaughter verdict meant Mary Winkler had beaten the murder charges and would not be spending the rest of her life in jail. The jury had given her a chance at a new life. I ask for mercy and understanding. At her sentencing, Mary still sounded like a devoted Christian wife. I think of Matthew every day in the guilt and I'll always miss him and love him. There were bad times, but there were good times, and I wish I could have that good Matthew and that we could get live together forever. The judge ultimately surprised everyone, especially jurors who wanted a stiffer sentence. The defendant is hereby sentenced to a term of three years. Her sentence is to be served in split confinement with 210 days of incarceration. This was a clear victory for Mary and her team. With time served, she would only spend another week in jail and 60 days in a counseling facility. The argument that Mary Winkler was a battered wife, trapped in a vicious cycle of abuse at the hands of the man she loved, was successful. She would soon be free. Some of the jurors felt betrayed by the light sentence.
I was really shocked that you were only in jail for so long. You deserve more time. Mary, you're going to have to live with yourself the rest of your life, and then you're going to have to face God in judgment. Arguments about how justice was served will continue to trouble this community and congregation. But the nagging question that will remain is how will this town come to terms with the victims in this case? The preacher and his wife. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020.